song we just sang, one of my very favorites. If that doesn't motivate you to worship the God of heaven, I don't know what will. Makes me think of Isaiah chapter 6. In the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up in his train of the temple. And above him stood the seraphim, each one having six wings. And with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, 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 Jehovah Rose, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook the voice of him which cried, and the house was filled with smoke. What a magnificent God we serve. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was set in heaven. And, uh, excuse me. After this I looked, and behold, a door was set in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as a word of trumpet speaking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit. And behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. God. Verse 5 says, Out of the throne proceeded lightning. And thunderings and voices displays of power. What a great God we serve. Tonight we're continuing our study of the book of Romans. <clears throat> Tonight we're in chapter 9. We're going to look at verses 9 over 11. <coughs> and again, I mentioned this morning that I am getting better, but I do still have a little bit of a cough, so bear with me. And uh, we'll try to get through this pretty fluently if possible. Uh, I'll go through quickly. And recap what we've learned so far, and then we'll get into the lesson here this evening. Romans chapter 1, verse 7, Paul is writing to the church, the saints in Rome. Paul says in Romans 1, verse 5, and Romans 16, and verse 26, that the book is both open and closed with the concept of obedient faith. We recognize that any faith written between those pages of holy writ is speaking thereof. That is of obedient faith, and that is never faith only. James 2, and verse 26, that is a dead faith. That is a a faith that will not save, James 2, 24. So we recognize that Paul is speaking of obedient faith and he's contrasting the power of the gospel over any other system, namely the law of Moses. Romans 1, 16 and 17, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God and the salvation to all those who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith unto faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. God's way for man to be deemed righteous is through the gospel and that is the only way. Man will not be deemed righteous any other way. Man is not going to live in perfect harmony with the law that he is under, and he's not going to earn his salvation. Galatians 3 verse 11. We're going to see that tonight. We're going to see that it is impossible. We're going to see as we continue in chapter 10. We're going to see that the only way for man to be deemed righteous is through the gospel. The end of chapter 1, Paul shows that ancient Gentiles are under condemnation. Chapter 2, Paul shows that Jews are under condemnation. Romans chapter 2 and verse 13 says, For not hearers of the law are just before God, but doers are just. So we recognize that concept. Even though they had, Romans 3 and verse 2, the oracles of God, that is the, the, uh, the law and the precepts and ordinances associated therewith, they didn't keep it perfectly. And we recognize that if they had been doers in every aspect, they would not have needed redemption. But of course, that is where we all fail and fall short of His glory. Romans chapter 3. Paul sums up and shows that all are under condemnation. Romans 3 verse 19 says, For whatsoever the law saith, it saith to them under the law, that all may be just, or all may be condemned, that they all stand guilty in God's sight. That means that everybody's under the law of some sort, every man is amenable to some sort of law, and all are guilty by their own breaking of such law. And all stand guilty before God. He says the same thing in verse 23, for all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Paul says now in verse 24, being justified freely by his grace. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Where is redemption found? Christ Jesus. What makes one, uh, what, what does one have to do in order to be in Christ? That is back to 1, 16 and 17. Obey the gospel and you are placed in Christ. You are added to the church. Acts 2 and verse 47. So we have a system of grace that is found in Christ. Christ is our propitiation. He is our appeasement. Romans 3 and verse 25. 1 John 2 and verse 1. He is our, uh, our mercy seat. As it is. Uh, as it is. He, uh, in verse 26, he says that God must be just and the justifier of him. What does justified mean? Just as I've never seen. Justified. Clean as a whistle. One who can be so scarred that Isaiah 1 verse 18. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they should be as white as snow. How, Lord? The blood of Christ. Mm -hmm. Appropriated by the gospel of Christ. So 
God is the justifier of him who hath faith in Christ. Romans 3, 26. What kind of faith? Obedient faith. Romans chapter 4. <coughs> Excuse me. Romans chapter 4. Paul shows that righteousness is not of the law. And he gives an example. Abraham was justified apart from the works of the law. Therefore, righteousness is not of the law. If Abraham was justified in a way other than, than the law, is the law the exclusive way of bringing man to God? No, it is not. The law served, as we'll see, a schoolmaster. And we're studying that in this chapter as we're, we're going through now. But what you have is, in Romans chapter 4, you have a blessedness that is spoken of in a positive and a negative way, verses 6 through 8. And that is, blessed is the man whom the Lord will impute righteousness to. And blessed is the man whom the Lord will not impute sin unto. And that is the same individual, and that is the individual where? Romans 8 verse 1. In Christ. Where there is no condemnation. Where we have access, as Brother Jerry mentioned this morning in Bible study, to the blood of Jesus the Christ. 1 John 1, 7 and following. So we have chapter 4 is a superiority of the gospel to the law of Moses. And he shows that righteousness is of faith, not of works of the law. That doesn't mean no works. We've already covered that. Romans chapter 5. He opens it and says the first two verses that we have access into grace by faith. What kind of faith? Obedient faith. And we stand there and we rejoice and hope in the glory of God. Verse 2. Romans chapter 5, beginning in about verse 6 through about verse 11, you have that we were absolutely undeserving in every way of the mercy, yet Christ still died for us, and in so doing he made redemption possible. Verse 8 and 9, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 12, he begins the thought through verse 21. I'm talking about how for by one man's sin entered the world and death by sin. And we recognize we're talking about a spiritual death. Spiritual death because it's contrasted to what? Life. Eternal life. And we have life through whom? Christ. So by one man, sin entered the world and death by sin. And by one man, righteousness entered the world and life through him. And so we have that contrast between Adam and Christ. Romans chapter 6. <coughs> Excuse me again. Verse 1, he asks a question. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And the answer is, God forbid. How shall we who are dead to sin continue any longer therein? How can we live in that anymore? He answers the question. He shows that they were dead to sin. In fact, they had died, they had been buried, and they had been resurrected anew. So that is verses 3 through 5. Romans chapter 6 and verse 3. Know you not that, the new, uh, that you, uh, as many of us were baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death. We contact the benefits of Christ's death whenever we are baptized into that. That is an immersion. Verse 4, that is a burial. And that is also where we can rise to walk in a new life. How so? Because we are forgiven of all our trespasses. Colossians 2, 11 and 12. Verse 5, it is in baptism that we are planted together with Him. That is, united with Him. It is in baptism that we unite with Christ. And again, I've said before that if someone says that we can be saved without being baptized, then they are implying that we can be saved without being united with Christ. And of course, they wouldn't even affirm that if they realized the significance of their statement. So we have Romans chapter 6, the first five verses covered. We go now into verses 16 through 18, and Paul is teaching another very important truth. And you can, as I've mentioned so often before, in verse 16, a parallel verse is Romans 2 and verse 8. We recognize that there's only two choices. You can obey righteousness or death. Uh, obedience unto righteousness or sin unto death. He says in verse 16, Know ye not that to whom you submit yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. Two choices. Then he tells those in Rome. Remember this. He tells those in Rome. And remember this when I get to the next chapter. Those in Rome, he said, But thanks be to God that whereas ye were servants of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching, and having been made free from sin, you became servants of righteousness. Verses 17 and 18. How did that happen? What form? Verses 3 through 5. Death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That is the gospel in its simplest form. 1 Corinthians 15. It entails more than that. It's all the teachings of Christ. But we have a reenactment of that death, burial, and resurrection in baptism, don't we? We do. So remember that they were made free from sin. And I want to come back to that in just a minute. Romans chapter 7. <coughs> Excuse me. First four verses. Paul uh, uses an allegory. He shows that the nation of Israel was amenable to the law of Moses until which time the giver of the law would take it away. Until which time the law was what? Dead. And it's compared to a marriage. And as long as the husband lives, the wife is bound to the husband. And as long as the law is in effect, 
the nation of Israel was bound to it. But guess what? Some half it didn't. Verse 4, they were free from the law to marry another. What happened? Colossians 2.14, Christ nailed it to his cross. And that law was taken away. And we aren't amenable to it. And neither were the Jews during the first century. Once this gospel came into the world, and it went forth from Jerusalem unto all nations, Luke 24, verse 47, that took away the old and established the new, the Hebrews writer said. And now all of Israel and every man walking this earth is amenable to that law. That is the law of Christ. 1 Corinthians mm -hmm. 9, verse 21. So we have uh, verse seven, or chapter 7, beginning in verse 14. I said I would come back to it, and I am now. Remember verse 14? We always talk about chapter 7, don't we? Difficult verses, verses 14 through 25. We have to understand that Paul is teaching here, and he's not using the first person speaking about his own personal conflict, as so many of my friends and brethren like to say. He's not talking about an internal conflict he has with himself. No, he's not. Verse 14, is Paul a slave to sin? Is he sold under sin? What did he just say in the last, verse, last chapter? Thanks be to God that where is your servants of sin? He became obedient from the heart. And what happened? They were made free from sin. So an apostle is a slave to sin, and yet these Roman Christians weren't. That's absurd. So again, verses 14 through 25 of chapter 7, Paul is using a first person, he's using a literary device to teach a truth about a man under the law. When? Remember this? Then. What's in chapter 8? Now. Chapter 8, verse 1. Now there is therefore no condemnation to them in Christ who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Then, chapter 7, carnal mind. Now, chapter 8, spiritual mind. So what is the difference? We see a, a vast difference. Chapter 8, verse 6 sums up nicely the first part of this chapter. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. That is the basic thought prevalent in the first dozen or so verses, give or take a few, of chapter 8. Chapter 8, we said towards the end of the chapter, we have wonderful hope, beginning in verse 28 through verse 39. We uh, would quote that both those series of verses regarding the book of Revelation because they're applicable. They are uh, uh, very reassuring. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ as long as we're faithful to Him. Mm -hmm. Now it comes to chapter 9. Chapter 9, remember, Paul is talking still to the Roman Christians. And now who is he talking about? Israel. He calls them his kinsmen. They are his brethren. And he has heartfelt sorrow for them. Why? Because they are continuing in the law and they haven't submitted to the gospel of Christ. Why does he bring it up now? Remember chapter 8? A spiritual mind produces what? Spiritual things and hope. If you could sum up chapter 8 in one word, it would be hope. And yet, what does Israel not have? Hope, because they're not in Christ. So that is why Paul is sorrowful. So now let's read those verses, and then we'll get into verse number 9 tonight. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ, my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, who are, uh, whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Not as though the word of God had taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. So that gets us to verse number 9. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. Let's look back to when this is spoken of. We studied it not too long ago in Genesis. Chapter 18, verse 10. And he said, I will serve and return unto thee according to the time of life, and lo, Sarah thy uh, wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age. And it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I have a surety bear a child, which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life. Sarah shall have a son. We noted as we studied that, that meant the set time next year, the same time they were going to have this child. God ratified this very promise to Abraham previously. Chapter 15. That's what that chapter is all about. It is a confirmation of a covenant. And it is a covenant already given. 
And God goes back and he reassures Abraham about these things. Notice, <clears throat> after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. What is he saying? He's saying that he has no seed of his own. And it's going to be a hired servant that is going to be heir of all of his riches. But God had already told him back in verse tw chapter 12 that all nations are going to be blessed through him. So that promise in reality started way back then. But behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. Then he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell, Number the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted to him for righteousness. This is mentioned by Paul because of the mentioning of the children of promise, that clause in verse 8. Abraham had two sons, yet only one was the son of promise, right? This, of course, is symbolic of what two nations? The nation of Israel and the church. Same concept. Paul discusses this further in Galatians chapter 4, beginning in verse 22. Notice. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bond babe and the other by a free woman. But he who was of a bond woman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which tendereth to bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answers to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with their children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. We have two covenants contrasted. We have two institutions, a nation and a church. 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. This promise would come through Sarah, not Hagar. This seed would come by promise, not by man's wisdom. Genesis 16. What am I talking about? Ishmael is a product of whose wisdom? Man's wisdom. Man's wisdom ain't good enough, is it? There is a way which seems right to a man with the ways of the road, the ways of death. Proverbs 14, verse 12. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. Proverbs 12, verse 15. It is a fool who trusts in his own heart. Proverbs 28, verse 26. Are you getting my point? Man's wisdom isn't good enough, is it? God said, if it's by the promise, then it isn't man's wisdom. Keep in mind also the context of Paul speaking about Israel, and that Israel was of the seed of Abraham according to the what? Flesh. But we are children of God how? By faith. Mm -hmm. For you are all the children of God by faith. For as many of you have been baptized in Christ have put on Christ. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Verse 10. <coughs> and not only this, but when Rebecca also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac. Not only is this true regarding Abraham, but Isaac as well. Not only is it true that uh, just because they were of the, the seed of Abraham, that they weren't the children of God. Not only is it so with Abraham, but it's also true with who? With Isaac. Isaac had two sons also to speak of. And we're going to see that in this case, with Abraham's, there was uh, two sons from two different women, and one wasn't his wife. So there were different circumstances. Now guess what? Now you're going to have two children from the same mother and the same what? The same womb. But there's still going to be a choice made. He had two sons, yet the promise would go through Jacob, not Esau. Both Esau and Ishmael were the elder brothers. Have you ever noticed that? They were older. Yet God didn't choose them. God chose the younger to go through. He chose upon a different criteria, didn't he? What was it, age? No, it wasn't age. Why did he do this? Now, here's where we're going to diverge from some of our Calvinistic friends. Because our Calvinistic friends are going to say that God did this of his own sovereignty and in, in an absolute arbitrary choice just because he whimmed to, to choose them. But of course, we recognize that God does nothing whimsical as far as that's concerned. Everything that God does has a purpose and can only be what? Right. And we recognize that God has chosen folks before based on something. Not nothing. 
Notice why he chose Abraham. Genesis chapter 18, verse 19. For I know him, that will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. Why did he choose him? Because he knew he was going to be faithful. Likewise, God in the character of Jacob's lineage. I don't believe that the choice was made for Jacob, per se, as it was for his lineage. And I, see, I think we can see that in Genesis 25, verse 23. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other, and the elder shall serve the younger. Of course, this is going to start with who? Jacob and Esau. But it went deeper than that. God chose a lineage. God chose Jacob's lineage. God knew that Jacob was going to have 12 sons. And God knew that those were going to be the 12 patriarchs. God knew these things. God knew this lineage. God foreknew all of this. And he chose in a display of his sovereignty and a display of what? Infinite wisdom. Lest we think this is totally arbitrary, notice the character of Esau. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 12. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Esau was a profane person. And much of his lineage would be as well. While we do take into consideration what is mentioned in verse 11 regarding this, and we'll get to that in just a minute, that choice doesn't negate God's foreknowledge. God did choose. It was of the promise of him that calleth. And not of necessarily the works that these children are, are either rewarded or punished for. But God's foreknowledge still can't be excluded from that. It was based upon the understanding of how Jacob's lineage was going to be. And it was going to fulfill his will in bringing about Christ. And of course, we can see that throughout all of Scripture. The last clause of verse 11 is strictly a reference to his sovereignty and wisdom. It shows that God chose Jacob, the younger son of the same parents as we said, opposed to Ishmael and Isaac. This, however, does not negate the fact that God foreknew the nation that would come through both Jacob and Esau. And who did he choose? He chose Jacob. Our Calvinistic friends, we said, they want to remove the character of these folks from God's decisions. Why was, why was Noah chosen? And Noah walked with God. Why was Enoch chosen? And Enoch walked with God. Amos 3 verse 3 asked the question, can two walk together except they are agreed? You can't walk with God if you're going your own direction, can you? You can't walk with God if you're guiding your own steps, can you? Someone has to be guiding. Who's that? God. You cannot dismiss the faithful, obedient character of the line of Jacob from God's decision. These facts kept in the context of this chapter show us that the fleshly nation of Israel, just as Ishmael and I, uh, Esau, were not the children of God. Remember we said that last week? We talked about that there are some folks who believe that just because you are a created human being, that you are a child of God. That's not what the Bible says. Now, we understand what you mean. Are you a creation of God? Sure. In some sense, can you say that? Sure. But let's talk. If we're going to talk, let's talk Bible ways. Mm -hmm. Let's say things in Bible manners. Let's say what the Bible says, and let's use terms that way. Let's not call ourselves a pastor if we say it is no religious affiliation. If it is a biblical term. If we're going to talk about the children of God, let's say what God has said about it. And that is that those are only by faith. Rather than lineage, what is the criteria? Of course, faith is the criteria. And you know what? It has always been. That lineage was never intended to be the all in all. It was always a faith. Remember Romans chapter 4? That's exactly what that chapter deals with. It was always of faith. The nation of Israel would come and they served their purpose. But God has always rewarded the faithful. The law of Moses was never intended to be forever. Verse 11. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that called it. The children here is a reference to Esau and Jacob. Verses 12 and 13. That's what's being spoken of in this context. Paul shows that God fulfilled his promise based upon his own choice and reasons. 
rather than as a direct consequence or actions of the children. If we remember the context of this chapter, Paul is saying that this purpose of election came through the promise of God to Abraham, and it was fulfilled in which way? Law of Moses or Jesus the Christ? Christ. Did the law of Moses fulfill the promise to Abraham? No, sir. Did it work it about? Did it come through the giving of the law in the nation of Israel? Sure it did. But Christ is the fulfillment of that, as we see in Galatians chapter 3. Neither having done any good or evil. Who is he talking about? The children. Having yet not been born. Having done nothing good or evil. Children are born how? Innocent. Ezekiel 18 verse 20. The soul that sinneth it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. And the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Notice also that at some point we choose to do either good or evil. Isaiah 7 verse 16 speaking of Jesus the Christ. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land of Alephorus shall be forsaken of both her kings. That's the purpose of God. What is the purpose of God? Brother Frank Chester in his book, The Portrait of God, laid it out so intricately and so plainly that from Genesis chapter 3 to Revelation chapter 22, there is one purpose. Redemption. Redemption for man. And every page drips with that precious blood. And every situation that we read about, every account, every king, every, uh, every account that we read of, that is the background context of it. And that is redemption for man. That is God's purpose. Redemption for man. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord, to them who are called according to His purpose. Romans 8 verse 28. How are we called? 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 14, we're called through the gospel. Mm -hmm. He that committed sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. What purpose? That man could be freed from sin through the blood of Christ, according to the eternal purpose which he hath purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. From eternity it was in the mind of God. Ephesians 3 verse 11. Now Jacob and his descendants were chosen so that the purpose of God may stand, not of works, but of him that called it. That's, that's what it says in the last clause, verse 11. Could anyone truly disrupt the purpose of God? Isaiah 43, and verse 13. I will work, and who shall hinder me? The Lord asks. His purpose was seen in the birth of a man-child, Genesis chapter 4, to replace the slain righteous Abel. His purpose was seen in taking Abraham out of Mesopotamia and later out of Herod into a land which he shall show thee. Genesis 12, Acts 7, verse 2. His purpose was seen in the seed of Abraham being sold into bondage to Egypt with Joseph. <coughs> Genesis 37. His purpose was seen in some years later removing this people out of this oppression and giving them the law of Moses. Genesis, or Exodus 12 and Exodus 20. His purpose is seen in choosing the youngest son of Jesse. Not based on age, but based on his heart. 1 Samuel 16. His purpose chose a godly woman, Jehoshiba, to save the last seed royal from certain death and from a a severed lineage from David to Christ, 2 Kings 11, verse 1. His purpose chose a meek virgin to bear the very son of the living God, Matthew chapter 1. Mm -hmm. All of these things were done to accomplish what? His purpose. What purpose? Redemption for man. 1 John chapter 4, John speaks about God is love. We love because He first loved us. Oh, how obvious that is to anybody who would look through the annals of these pages and see that thread woven through there and see the painstaking effort that God has done. He has gone through to make this redemption possible. The effort and the suffering that our Savior endured for us, revealing these truths and confirming them 
through power in the first century, having them confirmed, having them recorded diligently over and over and over by uninspired men for the past almost 19 <coughs> centuries. They have been kept pure so that we have it even to this day. Does God love us? Oh, He does. And He's proven it. All of these things were done and we could have accomplished none on our own. According to the election, what does this mean? <coughs> Excuse me. God chose that redemption will be found where? In Christ. Ephesians 1, 3 through, uh, 3 through 7. We have all spiritual blessings in Christ. We are accepted in the beloved, verse 6. We have forgiveness of sins, verse 7. All of these are found in Christ. This was mentioned also in the previous chapter. It says, For all things work together for good to them who love the Lord, to them who are called according to His purpose. For whom He did foreknow, He did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son. How? How are we predestinated? In what way? Only in the way that we are to be conformed to the image of His Son. Predestination does not mean that God arbitrarily chose, chooses who is saved and who isn't. There's nothing you can do. That means that God has established a place of redemption and man can either choose to be in it or choose to be out. This is not unconditional election. But this election is based upon conformity to His will. Hear Peter out. Elect. Isn't that what we're talking about? Election. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Notice this. Through sanctification of the Spirit. How does the Holy Spirit sanctify? Through His Word. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy Word is truth. John 17 verse 17. Unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Christ. What happens to us when we obey the gospel? We contact the blood of Christ. And we are forgiven of our sins. Grace of you and peace be multiplied. Who are the elect? The elect are the obedient. The obedient, the faithful, the church. This election is based upon faith, not works of the law. And again, that is why Paul emphasizes that in verse 11. That it wasn't based upon uh, Jacob and Esau's actions per se, but God shows. And that shows that it was according to the promise. And it was according to the what? Ephesians 3 and 11. The plan. Don't you ever think that God didn't have this plan? from before the foundation of this world. He did. Not of works, but of him that called. That's why he said this. Not of works. Does that mean not of any works? Folks, election in and of itself, as we've just proven, it, it requires something of us. Mm -hmm. But what he's saying is, this is not works of what? Who's he talking about? Israel. Not works of the what? The law. What law? Law of Moses. But of him that called. Works of the law would not justify man because man never kept them perfectly. Galatians 3. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is every man that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. For the just shall live by faith. Paul is not saying that there is no work that we are to do. If so... Notice just a few passages in the book of Romans where he contradicts himself. If Paul is saying that there's no works at all, he contradicts himself. Chapter 1, verse 5, 326. Chapter 4, chapter 5, 1 through 2. Chapter 6, 3 through 5. Chapter 6, 16 through 18. Chapter 8, the entire chapter about a car on a spiritual mind. Chapter 16, verse 26. What about the other places? Acts 16 through 19, Galatians 3, Ephesians 1, the whole book of Ephesians. Philippians 2 and 3, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Philippians 2 and verse 12. Colossians 1 and 2. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. And many others. So we recognize that Paul isn't saying there is no work to do. He's talking about works of the law. He is speaking about Israel and that this election is not of works of the law but of faith. Romans 3, 24 through chapter 4. It is of him that calleth according to his will and his purpose. Is what is being said here. Redemption was in the mind of God from eternity. Revelation 13 and verse 8. He is a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And that redemption was always intended to be through Christ and his church. Not the law of Moses. The church of Christ is a fulfillment of the promise to Abraham. That all nations will be blessed through him. Since the seed. Singular. Galatians 3.16. Built it. And redemption is found in it. 
Isn't that simple? In this way, it could be what? Of faith. In this way, it could be of what? Grace. And not of works of the what? Law. What a wonderful study the book of mm -hmm. Romans is. And I hope that you're enjoying it as much as I am. I look forward to next week. At this time, I'd like to extend the invitation. If there are any who have never obeyed the gospel of Christ, <clears throat> faith, repentance, confession, and baptism into Christ, faithful living unto death, for those who have obeyed the gospel of Christ, perhaps you have fallen away, perhaps you're living in such a way as that you are uh, doing things that you know you should not be doing, you're still engaging in things that you need to repent of, please consider tonight that you may not have another opportunity. Consider tonight that if, if you pass away, you will enter eternity either prepared or unprepared. Those are the only two choices. If you've obeyed the gospel of Christ, there's no reason for you not to acknowledge your sin to God. A humble prayer, repent of that, and He will forgive you. If you need the prayers of the church, we'll pray with you and for you. We'll do everything we can to help you. The invitation is yours. If you have any need whatsoever, please come down as we stand and as we sit. Oh.